Good morning, Rehoboth. I'm so glad to see you guys. Welcome, welcome. Whether you're joining us in this room or online, whether you're a regular or a guest, I want to say welcome you. I'm Joy Fowler. I'm the worship leader here at Rehoboth. And I'm so glad to be with you this morning on this lovely Father's Day. If you're a guest this morning, we want you to feel welcome. If you're at home, you're definitely welcome. Uh, but everybody is welcome in the house of the Lord. I want to invite you to stand. I want you to invite you to lift your praise and worship to make much of our Savior this morning. Put your hands together, lift your voice, lift your hands, lift your hearts in worship as we praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the best Father of all. He is good. Let's praise Him. Who am I that you are mindful of me? song. The Bible says sing a new song unto the Lord, right? But today is a great day to make this declaration of faith. It's very simple. The chorus you're going to recognize immediately from the scripture. 
And it just says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Can y'all say that with me? Right out loud. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't think I heard you convincingly enough. Could you say that just a little bit more? As for me. I like it. I think they did better than you guys over here. Can you say that for me? Can you say that as unto the Lord? As If you mean that this morning, if that is your heart's solemn prayer, then sing this with me together as we proclaim this wonderful message. your hand would you believe that's not a new song that is from the early 90s how about that wow it's called the family prayer song and we are a family amen we're a church family we're physical families but as for me and my house we're gonna serve the Lord would you sing that with us you never heard that song until just now guess what you've heard it you've heard it now Make that declaration with us again. Come and fill our homes. Here we go. Come and fill our homes with your presence. Beautiful song. Thank you, worship team. Always a great job. And welcome to Rehoboth. If this is your first time here or your first time online, welcome. We're happy to see you. Um, and if you'd like to uh, stop by the welcome table just over on my left, your right at the end of the service, we'd be happy to meet you and see how we can serve you. If you're online, drop us an email at pastorsoffice at rehoboth.org. We'd love to chat with you. Today is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day for everyone out there, uh, all the father figures, all the soon-to-be fathers, and we have some soon-to-be fathers in here as well, so that's exciting. But 
We do appreciate you and everything that you've done and you do for your children and for your families. We also recognize it's not necessarily an easy day for everybody. Not everybody had an easy relationship or a great relationship with their father. So we thank you for um, fathers for, for being good examples, but we also, we stand with you if you haven't had that great relationship with your father. We have a heavenly father. Who, does, who we do have a great relationship with, and we can have a great relationship. Uh, for the, the kids, Camp Grace is coming up this week, so pray for those camp, camp counselors. Pray for the kids, too, so that they uh, stay in line. They have some fun, but not too much fun, right? Um, and then, uh, I guess, we want to thank you for your faithful, faithful giving as well. By your gifts, we're able to do things. And, and I thought of a, an old song as well, I think from about the same time as, as for me in my house, uh, is thank you for giving to the Lord. And it goes on and talks about a missionary came to a church and someone gave just the little bit that they could, but the little bit that they could impacted the life of someone else. And they were able to know God because of that gift. And one of the things that we're doing, one of the initiatives that we're going to take on is there's a church in Baltimore that you've probably heard Pastor Troy talk about. It's the Garden Church, uh, Pastor Joel Kurtz. Next week, we're going to be taking up a love offering for them. They're reaching the inner city people that don't get to hear the Word. They don't get to hear God, and they're getting to learn about God for the first time. This is an opportunity for to us to reach someone that we may never meet, but it's an opportunity to spread the word, and that's what we're here to do. Um, as we think about that, again, happy Father's Day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue to worship. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for giving us a firm foundation, for giving us your word, and Lord, that we have faith, that we can hope and we can trust in you. Lord, and I thank you for those... Uh, stories and those promises that you've given to us in the past that guide us and that point us towards you. Everything around us can point us towards you, Father. And I pray that you would continue to guide our hearts, lead us closer to you. Let us use this time of worship as you draw us closer to you. Open our hearts so that we may be able to see you uh, through this. I pray that you would just help us to be a light into a dark world and to be a source of truth and a foundation for those who are lost. I pray these things in your name. Amen.
Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. of praise. We thank you in this place with our hearts bowed, our heads bowed, our, our minds on and our focus on you. God, we thank you that we can cry out to you, our Abba Father. We can come to you, the daddy that we need so desperately in every human heart that you have created a place for us that we can come to you with any need, any time, anywhere, any, any circumstance, and that you, you are God, and you are good. 
And Lord Jesus, we need you. We need you in this place. We need you and we cry out for you over our families. We cry out for you over our city. We cry out for you over our country. God, we, your people, are desperate, desperate for your hand. And we come to you knowing that you are the only way, the truth, the life. And no man can come to the Father except through you. And God, we come to you. We place our lives in your hand. And we speak your name, the authority given over all mankind, over all the universe. The name of Jesus holds the power. And Lord, we rest in your power and in your peace because you are good. And we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. And we love you. And all God's children said, amen, amen. Be seated, please. I have the great honor and pleasure of introducing our guest speaker today as our pastor is away. Um, David Bradford is no stranger to, to a lot of folks here at Rehoboth, and we are grateful to have him with us. Uh, he and his wife, Lynn, were missionaries in Spain. They have three grown children and five grandchildren and are doing the work of the Lord in their family and in other families across our area. They have partnered with Rehoboth um, since 2016, providing counseling to couples and individuals, both from Rehoboth and the Tucker area, and have partnerships with some other churches in the area as well. They serve together with Find Hope Counseling. What a, better, what a better title for a place to find hope. Find Hope Counseling. We can find hope in Jesus. Their Christ-centered ministry is touching all sorts of lives. And we have the great privilege of hearing David share his heart with us. Would you please make welcome our friend, David Bradford. Good morning, folks. It's a privilege to be back here again. I know many of, of you know us, and we are here at Rehoboth most every, most every week uh, during the week. We're not often able to be here on Sundays. There's various churches that we work with, and so we're out and about on um, different days. But we're glad to be here with you today. Glad to be here with the people in the cloud, online. Hopefully even some of our own friends will, will show up um, online. So I'm going to, I've got a message today. So Pastor Troy asked me if I would uh, preach this weekend, this Sunday. And so I said, I need to pray about it. And as I was praying about it, um, it was as if I had the first thought of, well, what, what can I say? What do I have to say? But then I, I thought about it a little bit differently. What does the Lord have to say? And what would the Lord have me to say? <laughs> a way better question. So... You're, you're in a better place than you would have been if I had answered the other way. <laughs> um, but So I'm thinking about uh, different things that the Lord has used in our own lives, in our, in our family and in the counseling ministry and working overseas in ministry. The book of Ephesians has come up a lot. It's just uh, something we've used a lot. Um, now it's mostly in counseling that we use it and not typically preaching as I don't have so many uh, opportunities to do that. So I'm used to a dialogue. Uh, so if I stop and ask you a question, feel free to answer. Because <laughs> um, that's kind of the mode that I work in. Um, in. In seminary in Westminster in Philadelphia, one of our uh, counseling professors uh, did some research, wrote a paper, did 30 or 40 years of counseling, and concluded, counsel Ephesians. 
And he actually thought about it in terms of being able to use the, the material, use the teaching in the book of Ephesians to be able to help people with all kinds of, of struggles. And I, I hope that we'll see today the richness of just this one little passage. And I hope that that will encourage you wherever you find yourself today. Um, the Lord is with us and the Lord is speaking, I trust, through his word to us so that if, we're, if you find yourself weary and tired, if you find yourself lonely, uh, the Lord is with you. The Lord is here. If you're not sure you know the Lord, I hope that by the end of this message you will be sure and you will know our Lord Jesus Christ. So the passage that I wanted us to look at is in Ephesians chapter 4. Um, so I want to I read the passage. It's two, two paragraphs. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But you did not learn Christ that way. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, you've been taught to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put off or put on, put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. In, in human life, human growth, organic living and, and growing, uh, that's, what you, that's what you do. You're born and you grow and you, you hopefully make it to mature adulthood. And that's kind of the expected outcome, that everybody will be a responsible, tax-paying citizen and uh, won't commit any major crimes. <laughs> um, sometimes the expectation is not much more than that. But Scripture has a lot higher expectation and therefore a lot higher hope for you and for me. A major milestone of, of human growth, of childhood development, is learning to walk. So most every one of you here today has had the experience of, of having your phone and videoing a, a small child, maybe a friend, family member, neighbor, a small child as they take their first wobbly steps and then kaplunk down in their diaper. Most all of you have had that, that amazing sense of this is just so cool. Um, our youngest, <laughs> youngest granddaughter, Luna, um, we got to watch her do that, and it's just a precious thing to see. But it's an expected outcome for a little child that they would learn to walk. A friend of ours, uh, when he was in his 50s, blew up his, his Facebook page with pictures of his first steps. But these first steps were in his 50s. So it was on a tightrope. <laughs> Those... Those first steps were of him walking on a tightrope. Now, the tightrope, admittedly, was only about 12 inches off the ground, thankfully. Um, but that, <laughs> that was his learning to walk. And even though it was 12 inches off the ground, I had to say, wow, that's pretty, pretty amazing. Another friend of ours recently had to learn to walk all, all over again. She had to learn again. She had suffered brain damage from a severe accident. And so finally, she celebrated with the people around her uh, as she took her first steps while in her mid-30s at a physical therapy session. 
So in all three of these cases, walking is the expected outcome. The Bible uses the word walk to describe an expected outcome of our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's kind of awkward the way the, way, uh, the New Testament uses it, but you'll get used to it. We're going to see it several times today and uh, see what the Lord has to encourage us with from that. Um, thinking a minute about context, because we are, after all, we're just kind of coming right here in the middle of the book of Ephesians, and we're just sort of dropping in on what's, what's going on there. And we haven't I've been working through the previous chapters or the latter ones, so it's, we want to keep that in mind. We want to look at our context map, we might say. And so there's two, two major sections to the book of Ephesians. It's kind of simple in its structure, but very profound in its teaching. Two sections. The first section is chapters 1, 2, and 3. And in those chapters, we have teachings about God, about man, about sin, and about redemption. Chapters 4 through 6, the second part of Ephesians, are teachings about walking in holiness as Christians, walking in unity as brothers in Jesus, walking in love as we imitate God. So those, those two sections are kind of how you can very easily divide up the book of Ephesians and makes it easier to break it down and to study it. And again, here's another thing we learn from the context is that chapters 1 through 3 are what we call indicatives. Indicatives are just statements of fact. They tell us what is. And actually, these chapters tell us some pretty profound things about what is, about God, again, about man, about sin, and about redemption. And in chapters 4... through six are imperatives. An imperative is a commandment. So we have things that we do based on commandments. Those come in the second section. So notice also the order of things here. And, and you'd have to think and see if you remember in Colossians and uh, Philippians and other books, there is a very similar structure, but there's an order of things. in in their own purpose. So in in the Apostle Paul's writings, uh, the the order is always the indicative first and the imperative second. He tells us what's true about us before he gives us things to do. That makes a huge difference. If you think about it, our pattern normally is to try to think, well, I need to fix this, I need to fix that, I need to change this behavior, I need to break that habit. But we don't start there. If you start there, you'll wind up frustrated. You may be frustrated with where you are or where you are not in your Christian walk today. (laughs) And that could be part of it. So we got to go back and we got to stick with the order. We don't start out looking for verses to obey. We start out looking for verses to believe. And especially those that tell us about God and about ourselves, about our, our issue with sin, but about the remedy the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. He tells us what is true, and then based on what is true, he tells us how to live, how to walk, we might say. So that might sound sort of basic to you, but there's actually a profound insight here. We're no longer under law, but under grace. The Redeemer has already accomplished redemption for us. Redemption is bringing us into that right relationship with God. It's the remedy for our sins that put us at enmity against God. There is a remedy. It's Jesus. The Redeemer has already accomplished that. And through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, we are now part of the new creation in Christ. We were dead in sins in which we all once walked, but God made us alive together. That's important. God made us alive. We didn't make ourselves. We didn't cause ourselves 
to be born again. He made us alive together with Christ. And since these things are true, Paul urges us today. He urges us to walk, to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. So there is a bit of a tension here. There is a tension between the indicative and the imperative that we were just talking about. Um, and there's a New Testament scholar really, really uh, helpful in a lot of the writings of Paul, F.F. F. Bruce, and he puts it this way. He says, this tension is common in Paul's letters. It's summed up with the admonition, be what you are. Be what you are. Be and practice what the calling of God has made you. So in the Christian life, as we talked about with those three examples of walking, walking was the expected or at least the hoped for outcome. In our, our Christian faith, in our Christian life, in our walk, there is an expected outcome. And so as we're kind of dropped here in the middle of the book of Ephesians, we want to reference back to the beginning, verse 1 in chapter 4. If you have, have your Bible, you can look at that. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That's a positive expectation or expected outcome that you would walk in a manner worthy. In verse 17, we're going to see the negative one, which is don't walk anymore like the Gentiles do. Now this I, test, I say and testify in the Lord. That's Paul's way of highlighting something that's important. That's his yellow highlighter highlighting something that he wants us to really be sure and get. This I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk or as the unbelievers. So that's the Gentiles. Who are they spiritually? They're the unbelievers. They don't believe in our Lord. They are those who are spiritually dead, even as we once were. They're not alive to God with Christ. So... You must no longer walk as the Gentiles. This no longer walk implies that as Christians, you used, or as unbelievers, you used to walk this way. Now as Christians, Paul's urging us, don't walk that way anymore. Don't go back there. Um, and there are other passages as, that say more or less the same thing. In uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6, there's a whole long list of all these horrible sins that people were engaged in. And he says that in these, you too once also walked, Christians, when you were living in them before becoming a, alive with Christ. And Peter said something almost the same. Chapter 1, verse, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. For the first time, uh, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in the sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. They must no longer walk that way. Now, I'm just going to say, that's nothing new. You've heard that, you know that, ho-hum, wish this guy was finished. That there's something else to it that I can tell you, you have missed it at times, and I have missed it at times. Sometimes we haven't really caught what the Lord wants us to know. The good news of the gospel, the point in God telling us who we are in Christ and giving us teaching of that truth and then giving us commands to obey that's different. And it's different because it puts us back to starting, to beginning with Christ, to beginning with salvation, redemption, to seeing that that's who we are. And that, that's very different than, than just legalism or moralism or a positive philosophy. That's not what we're saying, and that's not what Paul was saying. 
is something actually very different that I want us to catch that I think the Lord would have us to, to really get. So, continuing about the Gentiles, in the futility of their minds, that's a description of the way they walked, those who did not believe in God. And the futility of their minds points to their futile, useless way of living as if there were no God. That's how they tried to live, to live as though there were no God. And so the question comes up, well, how in the world do people get into such a state of mind? And it's because of the fall of humanity into sin, and it persists still today because of unbelief. That's how they landed in that condition. Their understanding has been darkened. Uh, that darkening, darkened understanding affects all our thinking. It, it even affects mankind to where we can, we can take the word of God and we can stand over the word of God and we can judge and we can decide, does this really square with my scientific worldview? Is this really something that I think makes sense? And we believe we can stand over as judges of the scripture to determine and decide, do I think it's true? Do I like it? Do I want to do it? Do I believe it? Instead of bowing beneath and sitting under God's word. And that's the starting place that we have to be. And those who were darkened in their understanding, they didn't go there. They judged the scripture. They stood over it. God ca calls us to sit beneath his word, to bow down and, and believe the scripture is true because it is the scripture and because it is God's revelation to us. That's really an important difference as well in how we think about and how, how we live. The Gentiles lived alienated from the life of God. They were alienated from God and they were at enmity with God and they were still dead in their sin. And verse 18 goes on to describe why it was because of the ignorance that is in them. And the ultimate ignorance, of course, is ignorance of God. Because they didn't know God, they were ignorant of God. And that was due to their hardness of heart. The heart is the core of who we are. It's like the command control center of who we are and of everything we think and do. The Gentiles were hard-hearted. In verse 19, they have become callous. Their hearts were callous so that they really didn't have a functioning conscience. And that is, that is exactly what happens. As we walk in, in darkness, as we... Uh, have hardened hearts, we become callous to sinning and we're, we're able to do it and not think anything of it, I'll tell you, that's a dangerous place to be. Um, but there is hope. There is a way out. Uh, going on in verse 19, they have given themselves up to sensuality. Sensuality is simply a catchword of all kinds of immorality and impurity. And they were greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So, these verses describe how the Gentiles walked. And we can summarize their condition as darkened mind and callous or hard heart. That's where they found themselves. That was their condition. And I'll tell you, apart from God making a human being alive together with Christ... This is the human condition. And this is how it's been since the Garden of Eden with fall into sin and rebellion against God. Darkened minds, thinking they could judge better than God, thinking they could determine what was good rather than accepting what God said was good. So the expected outcome of our faith in Jesus is that we would live like Jesus Christ, that we would live in a manner worthy of our calling. So let's look at the second 
second major point here, learning to walk. So there's an expected out, uh, outcome and there's learning to walk. So how do we do that? Um, how does this passage teach us to walk? And there's two parts of it, the negative and the positive. Don't walk as Gentiles. Do walk as you learned Christ. So learning is a process. Uh, Paul uses a couple of metaphors in this passage. Uh, and walk is the first one. Walking is one of the Bible's vi vivid metaphors of how God how godly people should live both positively in terms of what to follow and negatively in terms of things to avoid. Another uh, commentator on Ephesians wrote that walking is a Hebrew idiom that refers to conduct that moves in a particular direction with steady progress. It pictures a life moving in a destination. So that's an excellent statement of the outcome that's expected of a believer in Jesus. And again, I want to tell you, this is not, here's a list of things to do, now go do them. That's not what we're saying and not what the passage is telling us, so bear with me. Um, our walk moves us in a particular direction, and it's the expected outcome. So in order to understand how our walk works, so to speak, we have to go back to the indicatives. And the indicatives tell us that our walk is supernatural. Christianity is something different. Christianity is not uh, a dead religion. It is a living supernatural faith in a living supernatural creator, redeemer, Holy Spirit that causes us to become alive together with Christ. So it's supernatural. We, you once all walked in sin because you were dead in sin. Now, in Christ, we are new creation. So there's another metaphor that I think is, is curious to look at and very helpful, and we're going to make some application from this next metaphor as well. Um, we all once walked in sin uh, while we were dead in sin, um, but something changed. God intervened, and by grace we were saved. So that's that supernatural aspect of Christianity. It is different. It is supernatural. It is a, a genuine hope. God said that he had promised to complete the work that he started in his children. The Lord will do that. It's not all on you and it's not all on me. The Lord has promised he will bring that work to completion because it's supernatural. It's God at work. It's not just our works of the flesh. It's not those at all actually. It's the work of God. So these indicatives tell us that our faith is supernatural. So let's look at one more indicative one more truth about our Christian faith. And this is if you want to flip back in chapter 1 of Ephesians, verses 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. There's two things there. There's an already and there's a not yet. We have already been sealed. It's a done deal in that sense. Our salvation is accomplished. It's finished. But until we acquire possession of it, that's the not yet. So there's this tension again, but that tension helps us to see the truth and the reality that in Christ, we are already sealed and promised redemption by the Holy Spirit, but until is not yet. It's not fully realized yet. That's like the kingdom of heaven has been inaugurated, it has begun, but it's not been consummated. That will occur at the return of Jesus, the second advent. 
So this is not something that we did or that we worked to achieve. It's something we received. That's what God has given us, and that's the supernatural reality of our faith. It's, so although the indicative tells us it's not yet, uh, until we acquire the possession of it, our walk is supernatural, and we will get there. God will get you there, and he will get me there. So this is what I want to look at. It's some more specific application uh, for the remainder of our time. So walking is a three-part process. And this is going to look again at that metaphor and then the the clothing metaphor. Um, And I'll explain that in a minute. The the three-part process includes learning to put off our old self and to put on the new self. But in the middle of that, it talks about being renewed in the spirit of your minds. So this is Paul's second metaphor. It's like putting off and putting on or like clothing. Um, Because we have learned Christ and we're taught in him, because we have been taught in him as the truth is in in Jesus, we can put off that. So put off your old self, verse 22. Our old self belongs to our former manner of life. And our old self is corrupt through deceitful desires. This includes all that we were in the flesh before the supernatural grace of God intervened and made us alive with Christ. This is all we were in the flesh. All that we were in the flesh, that's that old self, the natural part of our being, not the supernatural part of our being. That's what we were to put off. Um, So the first part, putting off, is kind of like changing one set of clothes for another. A friend of ours told us about visiting her grandma while wearing some of those jeans. This was a female. Wearing some of those jeans that have the holes already torn in them when you buy them maybe just above the knees or, or on, in that area of the knee. My daughter told me that it's, uh, it's called distressed denim. <laughs> so she was wearing distressed denim to visit her grandma, and her, her grandma saw her pants, saw those holes, and she said, Oh, honey, did you fall? <laughs> and... It, it was one of those things where maybe, maybe you drop the distressed denim before you go see Grandma the next time. I, I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> distressed denim. But either way, there, there is a taking off, like taking off a garment and putting on a different garment. What we take off is the old self, who we were in the flesh apart from Christ, And what we put on is the new self, the supernatural self, the self that will live for eternity. That's what we put on. So I think a a, a first thing I would say about how to do this is to identify the old self. So who is it? What is it? Where is my old self? Well, it's all that stuff that we just read about the Gentiles. All that stuff, all that sin, all that brokenness, all that darkness. That's the old self. That's who we were. And the Bible says we all once walked in these things. So that's what we need to put off. Um, and as you think about it, how would you put it off? You put it off by an act of faith. And I'm telling you, this stuff is so easy and way too easy to just rush through and reading. But we need to slow down and think about how do we apply this scripture? How do we apply this metaphor and learn from it and grow by it of putting off and putting on? It's got to be done as an act of faith. And the next part of that is to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Um, that's, that's a really interesting passage or phrase that puts it, but it's talking about the 
inward uh, person, not the exterior. It's talking about something that's going on inwardly, not just with behavior. It's inward person of the, of the spirit. The inward Christ in us is what we need to be renewed in. And God does that process of renewing. And you can contribute or take part in that process of renewing. So the third part is to put on the new self. And that new self is created after the likeness of God. That new self is created in true righteousness and holiness. So believing the truth about who you are in Christ, choosing to walk in fellowship with God. These are simple ways that you can apply that I try to apply these passages uh, in life. So that gets us to the last, the last point, walking with others. Walking with others. And I'm going to point to you, point out just one little chunk of verses that follow and actually these are the first imperatives and we're not going to do the whole passage it's chapters or chapter 4 verse 25 through 30 we're not going to look at all of those but those are a list of things you can see that are imperatives they are commands for us to do but they come after all of that explanation that we just went through they, they come in light of all that Paul has just taught us. So I want to look at just the first one. These are similar in that they have a positive and a negative. Uh, like the first one, don't lie, but be a truth teller. Um, and that verse, verse 25, reads, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. That put away, that's Paul doing what he just told us to do. He's putting it away. He's putting off the old self. He's putting off a specific old self of lying, a specific deed of the old self. He's putting that away and he's speaking truth to his neighbor. That's the new self, speaking truth. So putting off the old, putting on the new, because or for we are members of one another. And that's back to the truth of who we are in Christ, who the Lord has made us. So if you look at, in maybe later today or sometime this week, these other few verses there at the end of the chapter, each one of these works the same way, except the one on not grieving the Holy Spirit. That one's slightly different. But all of the rest of them actually all the way down to verse 32. And you can see how Paul shows us an example of how you work this out. How you walk. How you use that metaphor. Put off. Put on. And how we are transformed. So in conclusion, again, Professor Bruce said, The knowledge of God is never divorced from walking in his ways. To know him is to be like him, righteous as he is righteous, holy as he is holy. So there is an expected outcome. There is something that ought to be coming as fruit from our lives. We are supposed to walk in holiness, but we've learned to walk in a different way. We've learned today to walk by putting off the old self, we know what that looked like, being renewed in the spirit, the inward disposition of our heart and spirit, being renewed there and then putting on the new self. Be what you are. Be what you already are in practice. And keep on doing this more and more. Let's pray. Lord our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of who we are in Christ. And we thank you for the hope that we have of transformation in Jesus. Lord, please give us grace to understand these things, to diligently apply them, and Lord, to have hope in you. And we ask you this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, David. You know, you mentioned if if anyone came to us today who doesn't know Jesus, we want to give them an opportunity to do that. And I know some of our staff members are going to be down front. If you need a, a place to come, maybe maybe today's not a great day. And maybe you're searching for a savior or a church home or hope. Maybe you need to find hope. We know the author and finisher of our faith is the source of all hope. He is good and he is gracious. He is the most wonderful father. And we want to sing this song. We want to invite you to stand and sing along with us as a declaration to our God. Out of a heart of gratitude and praise, what a wonderful admonition for us. We aren't who we were. We aren't who we were. Those of us who are alive in Christ, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Amen. And it's because we have a good, good father who welcomes all of his prodigal children, those who've gone astray, and all of us have sinned and gone astray. But we have a good, good father who's given us an opportunity to become his children. If you aren't one of his children today, if you have never confessed your faith in Jesus Christ, let me urge you not to leave this place before you give it all to him because he alone, he alone is the source of hope. So as we sing this song, if you feel led to join us in the altar, I know our pastoral staff will be here to meet you and pray with you. If you have some praise in your heart to lift to God right where you are, lift it. Let's glorify him today. Alex, lead us. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell that you're pleased and
Because that's who God says we are. Doesn't matter what anybody says about you. Doesn't matter what you say about yourself. Doesn't matter where you've been on your worst day. In the darkest place, the light of Jesus Christ will brighten it up fully and completely and take you from that darkness to light. And he loves you just like he loves me. And he wants you, just like he wants me, to be free and to know him and to love him and to love other people. So take that, take what David brought to us from Ephesians, and thank you for speaking today. We appreciate you. And take the light and the love of Jesus out those doors to a lost, dark, dying, and broken world that we were once of. We're still in it, we're not of it anymore. Take it out there and be free. Have a good week. <laughs> <laughs>